I, I believe I was around 12 towards, no, I wouldn't say towards because I'm a junior and this happened in February. So I was not certainly going to, to be um, 13 then, but I was 12 hanging in there. And um, we heard about it. But prior to that, in this country, and this is the background to it, uh, we knew our people went to war. For some of us, our people went to fight for somebody else's fight. And the pain of it is that, and that is what leads to the Sergeant Ajete being mowed down with his colleagues. Um, when our people came back, our people died on song. The best I remember that happened in this country was that GBC, Radio Ghana then, um, was made to sometimes concoct letters for anxious pa parents and relatives in Ghana that the letters came from their people at the war front and they read and people were made to cry reading, feigning the kind of um, pain or illness about the people and others really feigning happiness in reading the stories that the letters were supposed or purported to be delivered uh, uh, from our people up front there uh, to tell us or assure the country that they are safe and well. When, uh, some had died, some weren't understand it. Our people were getting anxious, were very jittery. Your man goes to war and you haven't heard from him, for surely you want to be and feel some anxiety and you want to speak about it. Uh, the trouble is there was nobody to complain to, but for sure the system would have carried it by rumor or by word of mouth and it would have gone to where it should arrive. And the actions they took, among the actions they took was that even in broadcasting house, right, letters were read as if they came from the people in front. There might have been a few which were genuine, but I'm saying to you that in retrospect, and from what I know, that most of them were simply to uh, make sure that the people of the Gold Coast had been, were being told or informed that Her Majesty's government or His Majesty's government was how benign he was looking after our people who were in the war front. And this was colonialism for you. Anyway, our chaps like Ajete and Ko came back home First of all, they came back with nothing. Secondly, with that nothing, there was some protest of a sort on the quiet, and they started being given some stipend. Life was getting a little bit harder for them, and so they started writing petitions as an ex-servicemen's association. And the petitions, whether they arrived at the governor's residence or the governor's desk, nobody knew. But having done twice, they felt that enough was getting enough. They were err in, in hunger. If they had lived in their country, they perhaps would have been something else. And mind you, a majority, only a few of them came back with professions like pharmacists and carpenters and artisans and what you know you can. The majority were servicemen. They were servicemen, right? They came empty with nothing. And so it was legitimate for them to demand some kind of payment. Even today, some of us in, in our country claim what is called what um, end of service bonus, isn't it? Yeah. And very soon you're going to hear it from Parliament. You understand? They're going to pay money for themselves to themselves. Fine. So Ajete and Co were legitimately right to demand that something should be done. It was they were being given some pittance but they felt that they needed some more. So they wrote petitions, and the third one, they decided that in that case, they would themselves present it in person. So they got to the uh, Christiansburg Crossroad, the police barricade was there. Mind you, we've got a cheap. From here to reach hospital in those days, you daren't as an African, unless you are a pantry boy or you are a watchman. The policeman, your countryman will stop you and turn you back. You understand? It? Yes, that was colonialism. That's what we went through. You daren't. You understand it? So for them to dare from Mosul to that spot took some bra bravado. 
And then they got there, the police came to stop them, and they said no, they were servicemen, they were going to um, present an inocuous petition that, please, this is our plight, this is who we are, look after it for us and do something. You remember that common word, the household word, Baturi Yafadi, the white man has said. Their instructions was that they should not be let in, but they insisted. And of course the whitey, who was commandant of that police platoon, ordered. His name was Imre. He comes from Northern Ireland. He died. I was not able to attend his funeral, but I did see Governor Gogisbeck's funeral. Um, grave, and um, I did attend the, the judge, Justice Lingley, the man who sentenced Kofi Barakwa and Kwame Nkuma and all the rest of them at Cape Coast High Court. I deliberately did that because I needed to see it for myself. Not that when tomorrow morning I'm writing or speaking about it, just as I'm telling you, I know who, what, what was there. But just as what was there, um, they were mowed down, they were shot dead, right? And at that time in the country, we were beginning to uh, wake up. Remember, the environment had created, or uh, had grown into such a situation that it was volatile. The people of the country really wanted to establish something. Firstly, you remember the Aborigines Rights Protection Society. Um, they had, it was only a national movement. You, people talk, it was not, there was no political party. The only first political party in this country that was ever founded as a political party, but within, initially, the UGCC was the CPP on the 12th of June, 1949. That is when they had been released by Governor Creasy after lots and lots of pressure, right? from his de detention, which he thought was going to cow the people of the Gold Coast at that time. But that time, the Aborigines Rights Protection Society had been overtaken by the UGCC, founded and financed and inaugurated by Grandpa Pa Grant, George Alfred Grant at Salpon. Now, the momentum was already building, and then Niboni Usuala Tamanche had also started um, this agitation. Life was very, getting very hard, and they, everything, the prices were soaring, and our people couldn't afford, right? In industry, the workers were felt they were not being paid. And the UGCC had arrived to raise a certain new momentum that now if the Aborigines Rights Protection Society meant that we should have a a, a full say consulted in our own um, governing governance. Now we don't want it. We want a full gov full self government. So this, all of these coalesced into one Nibonese boycott. The industrial strike in the Western region started there, and then it spread to Accra with Nibonese thing, and then Ajete and Co coincidentally met their debt too. So you could see that there was a coalition of coincidences at that time which culminated in the final shootout of, um, our, of the three and then the final routing that occurred that if this is the way you're going to treat us then you have some more coming. And that is how it happened. 